everyone. Today, I would like to present uh, our work on formalizing the Qsharp programming language. And uh, I hope to convince you that Qsharp is an Algol-like language as well. Uh, this is joint work with Kesha Haitala from University of Maryland, Sarah Marshall from Microsoft Quantum, and Robert Wren uh, from University of Chicago. So uh, Qsharp is a programming language for quantum computing from Microsoft announced in 2017. It's really a F sharp like language, but it on the cover it looks like a C sharp like language. And there's a nice blog post in top by John Azaria, one of the developers of Q sharp, that explains the evolution of the language. Uh, the model used by the language is a usual QRAM, where quantum computer is considered as a coprocessor. And then it has several interesting algo like features, which are uh, very nice as a programming language person to me. So it, it, clearly separate between classical functions uh, and uh, quantum operations in the syntax of the language. Then the, all the computation on the quantum machine is done by side effects. So effectively, the quantum operations that we see in the language are monadic sequence of instructions. And our work kind of exposes that, which I'll show you. Other nice features are that most things are immutable by default in the language. And there are features for metaprogramming, such as you can automatically generate a joint and control versions of the operations. So here's a sample program in, tel to, in Q Sharp to show teleportation. So I'll not go through all the details, but a couple of things to highlight are uh, that Q Sharp is uh, parametric on the gauge set. So even to use the basic gauge, we have to import a library. Uh, the other thing to notice is that, uh, like I mentioned, the computations by side effects. So in this entangle function, the two qubits for Alice and Bob are passed, and we are just applying operations on them. Notice that there is no qubit being returned. Uh, this is the monadic interface in play here. There's no linearity involved. So qubits are passed by reference. You perform a unit computation in place and uh, trivial unit. Moving on. Um, why do we even need to do some, uh, why, why do we need to specify a QSHOP? Right. So in, it's very well known in uh, programming languages community that if you have a good foundation for a language, you can easily write and maintain programs in it. And there are several examples of this being formalized. Uh, well-known ones, the standard ML that we will follow in this work. There's Java, Go, uh, JS, and Rust. Uh, so other thing to note is that uh, Qsharp is a new and evolving language, and there's a design principle from Bettina Himes thesis says it's a living body of work which will grow. So our work is aligned with the course of the language. Uh, so having a well-founded meta theory will help it evolve. Um, so this is a general recipe we, we, we followed, uh, which was uh, designed by uh, people working on standard ML, uh, Harper and Stone in 2000. So, uh, you know, every language ultimately has a small language inside of it, which is uh, which, which shows its core. So that's the first step. You design a well-behaved or well-typed internal language. In our case, it's we are calling it Lambda QSHA. Then the second step is that you define a relation from a translation relation from the surface language or external language to this core. And the advantage now is that once you have the score, you can do all of your statics and dynamics, which means you know the type system and defining the behavior of the programs on the smaller core, and prove theorems on top of that. The other exam, uh, other thing we can do is now we can easily extend the surface language and see how it affects the core language and study the extensions and variations. So to motivate that in our work, uh, here are a couple of programs in QSharp which are invalid and should not be allowed by the compiler. Cloning operation, which uh, takes a qubit, creates a new qubit, makes a copy of that. So this is just copying the qubit and then applies C0. So this is using a same, the same qubit as both the control and target of C0, which is effectively uh, cloning the qubit. Uh, but it currently passes the QSharp type checker and fails at runtime in the simulator. Um, similarly, on the right, you see a, a function which creates a qubit and immediately returns the rest to it. So this also be disallowed because QSharp has this electrical scoping of uh, 
lifetimes of qubits. So wherever they are created, they are discarded in the same lexical store. But this is again allowed by the language currently, should be which should be invalid. So in our work, we we are able to uh, solve these problems, and I'll show you how. So here is the lambda Q sharp, uh, our core calculus, and I will go through the number of types and expressions and commands. So uh, the types are pretty simple. There are function types, there are product types, booleans, units, and there's one for commands because this is a monadic language. The most important type here is the QREF type, which is indexed. It, it, it is a qubit reference type to model qubits in Kishar. Uh, the important thing is it is indexed by these orange color symbols Q, which represent a single logical qubit. And we are able to statically track identities of these qubits. This notion comes from something called alias types back in 2000. And the idea goes even further on something called singleton types. Um, moving on to expressions, I'll not go through these details, but this is the usual simply type lambda calculus with uh, encapsulated commands. Uh, so we, our lambda Q sharp language is built upon uh, Harper's language, modernized and called from his book. Um, so this is very simple. Uh, now this is the more interesting part, uh, commands. So we have the monadic return and bind as usual. And then we have quantum specific commands. So the first one is new QREF, which creates a new qubit reference. And again, the key idea in this setup is that we, we have enforced the binding structure of the command in, the, in, in its uh, syntax itself. So we see that uh, the scope of qubit X is limited to the command M. And that way we can easily enforce a strict static uh, stack-like discipline on uh, lifetime of qubits. And we'll see how that helps. There's the gate application command. Um, given a unitary gate, you can apply it to an expression. Then there is there is this diagonal application. This is a interesting uh, syntactic sugar, which it's used for modeling controlled gates, where the you know the first e1 is representing a control and e2 represents the target qubits. And if the control is zero, you apply the first unitary. If it's one, then you apply the second unitary. And that's the usual measurement. So now let's look at uh, some of the typing commands. And I'll actually not go through any of these commands in details. I just wanted to understand the typing judgment and what's happening overall in most of these. And then we'll look at some examples in later slides. So the idea is that uh, apart from the context gamma in our typing judgment, we have this, uh, this notion called signature sigma, which is also indexing the judgment. And the way to read this is that this command M uh, is a well-formed command returning a value of type tau with respect to the context gamma and the signature sigma. So the role of sigma is to keep track of the qubit symbols that I mentioned, the orange color qubit symbols. Uh, and each of the qubit symbols in this sigma will be distinct. That is, there is no duplication. And you see, uh, I'll, I'll just show you this example right quick. So when we create a new qubit reference, a fresh qubit Q is allocated, added to the signature, uh, sigma comma Q. And then uh, it's bound to this variable X. And in this extended context, with the binding X and qubit Q, this command M would be uh, well formed. Okay. So let's just move on and see uh, how these uh, you know, things help us prevent some of the problems in QSHA. So here is the program we saw before to clone qubits. And in our Lambda q -sharp syntax, it looks like this. You create a new qubit, then you return the value of uh, executing the following command, make a copy of the qubit. So this says let q2 equal to q1, and then execute the following command, which is digap i2 comma x. And the C0 that we see here gets translated into uh, you know, applying identity on zero and X on one. So what happens? So here's the rule that we saw in the previous slide for diagonal gate application. Notice that uh, our rule requires that all of these RIs, uh, qubits, should be distinct, I from one to N, and the control qubit Q should also be distinct from R. This is a requirement from the signature. We said the signature keeps only distinct qubits. So now when we execute through this program in our um, Lambda Q-sharp syntax, we will realize that Q1's type is QRef Q1, 
and Q2, which was just a copy of the reference, also has the same type. So this rule does not apply and the type checker gives you an error. So this program is invalid in Lambda Q sharp. Right. Uh, looking at the other example, uh, it's very simple. Uh, the equivalent is creating an EQ bit and returning the reference immediately. So the rule we saw earlier, uh, what happens is when you are in the premise of the rule, this command, this typing is valid, that the type of return X is QRFQ because Q is part of the signature here. But when we reach the conclusion, this Q has disappeared because uh, of the static discipline that the language maintains and is visible in the syntax of the language. So then the then this type, which we see for the output, is invalid, and uh, we get a type error. So this is just a sampling. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do more in Q-sharp. So currently, our solution does not support arrays, which are which are a common feature in Q-sharp. So we would like to extend our work to that. And there are other major Q-sharp features, such as automatic generation of adjoins. We would like to see if we can uh, do it in a more type-safe manner. Then we are working on mechanization of the meta theory. Other long-term uh, goals are to do semantics preserving compilation to languages like QIR and from a verified tool chain using existing projects such as Vellum. Um, to conclude, uh, we think that both Lambda q -sharp and q -sharp are algorithm-like languages. And what I mean by that is that they safely combine pure and effectful computation together, which is distinct uh, nature, essence of algorithm-like languages. And similarly, they also enforce strict uh, stack discipline for memory management. Uh, please see the paper for more details. We also have a very nice equational semantics based on a fully complete equational theory by Sam Staten and then elaboration rules. Uh, and there is the paper on the archive or on the website. And I would love to take some questions. And we have some time for one or two questions. Uh, okay, so I'm uh, Vladimir. Uh, I have a question about your uh, judgment for new qubit references. So if you go back a few slides. Ah, okay. Yeah. So there, uh, you write the, the signature notation below the turnstile. But uh, this makes me think that there might be some connection between what you're doing in uh, dual intuitionistic linear logic, where basically the sigma and the Q can be seen as a linear context. Uh, does this make sense? Have you considered this? Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, the sigma, as formally defined, is, uh, is one can think of it as a stack. It's just collecting qubits and removing them but it does not have any structural properties associated with it. So you're right that there, there must be some connection which we have not investigated. Thanks. More questions? Hi, Hi Karthik, Robin Sales. Hello. Um, so you mentioned uh, adjoints. So do you support adjoints? Uh, not right now, that's our future work. Okay, so what would it take for you to support adjoints? Do you have any uh, well, idea? There are, yes, yes. Uh, so there are a couple of issues with Q sharps and joins. Uh, so it's easy to support the easiest version where they have, you know, you only have unitary operations in a sequential manner in the operation, in a given operation. But Q sharp claims to support adjoints in some other more interesting cases as well, such as when measurement is involved or classical computation is involved. So that requires a little more careful work, which we are yet to do, but that's certainly planned in future. Okay, thanks. And I think we can do one more. Um, okay, if there's no more questions, then I'll say thank you to Kartik and all the other speakers, and we can wrap the session. Thank you.